All right. So with that, I'm going to transition to Jay, uh, who is actually going to be sharing his perspective and helping us to think and look at why leaders discover their personal core during tough times. So a little bit about Jay. Uh, I, I think most of us know who Jay is. Um, and I'll talk a little about my own experiences uh, having been in conversations where there are sessions which are addressed by Jay. So um, Jay is one of the most recognized uh, leadership influencers of our times. Um, he's been quoted in magazines like um, Financial Times, Business Week, as one of the top leadership teachers uh, across the world. Jay has taught in Harvard, he's taught in London Business School, he's taught in, uh, in CIAD, he's uh, teaching in uh, USC, uh, University of Southern California, has authored over 15 leadership books, which are the bestsellers, and has authored over 100 articles which are published um, across the world. Very often quoted in magazines like Economic Times, Business Week, Financial Times, and I'm, I'm one of those keen followers or avid observers of how Jay's journey has been and his thinking and his way of really uh, bringing leadership to life is something which has influenced my own, um, my own views on leadership. I think what sticks out uh, for me, uh, Jay, when I've had the opportunity to be in conversations with you, I've happened to know Jay for the last four or five years. When I moved to the US uh, as a um, uh, head of talent for Mondelez, and I started interacting with Jay more closely, actually, I was observing him from a distance. And I realized how, how simple he makes the knowledge or understanding of leadership yet his insights are so profound, which stay with you for a long time. And I've, I've been part of many such conversations. I've never seen or come across anyone of the caliber of Jay to bring uh, the science of leadership to life in a way that it becomes relevant for anyone who's interested or keen to learn about leadership. So without spending more time uh, on that, uh, this is my privilege, Jay, to uh, have you join us in this conversation. So over to you. Thank you, Atul, for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to work hard to live up to that. <laughs> uh, so nice to see all of you virtually. Uh, welcome to my home office. And I'm looking forward to spending the next 40, 50 minutes with you, kind of sharing my own reflections and experience on this somewhat elusive topic we call a leadership. And um, I know we're going to have some opportunities to kind of interact through questions. So looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to cover three dimensions uh, today, which are related to the fact that in a crisis and a kind of deep challenges, um, leaders, first of all, tend to be under a more intense microscope. And uh, so what happens is your flaws are more magnified. Um, your strengths are more magnified. So it has both a positive and a negative advantage, that microscope. Number two, in crises or deeply challenging situations, what happens is something we call emotional contagion. And I hate to use that word in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm going to use it anyway. And that is that in a leadership role, your emotions become literally contagious with the group you're leading. So if you bring us an attitude of pessimism and anxiety or fear, that quickly kind of cascades through the team or actually the entire organization. And the third thing is in times of challenge, you actually have to rely upon the collective wisdom the wisdom of the team, the wisdom of the organization, the wisdom of crowds. And so it's very hard to be a narcissistic leader, uh, one who believes that they have the solution, they have the answer. And so the leader's ability before the crisis to build a kind of state of psychological safety gets ultimately tested in the midst of a crisis. And usually, of course, what we discover is they did not build that foundation of safety. And so they're unable to create the kind of courageous conversations and kind of brainstorming and 
really an entrepreneurial spirit and versatility that would allow them to succeed in the midst of a crisis. So those are the three areas I'm going to cover in the roughly 15 minutes that a tool has given me to dive in. Um, and I would begin with a wonderful saying, the legendary investor Warren Buffett always used to say that, you know who's been swimming naked when the tide goes out. And so in times like this, you actually get to see who lacks leadership ability. You get to see who's actually incompetent. And we're watching this across the world with world leaders and politicians. Uh, you get to see who's deeply narcissistic and really has been uh, unable to build a cadre of talented people around them because they've sought out yes people, people who would defer to their judgment, which in a crisis tends not to be enough to get you through the crisis. Uh, you get to see who's highly controlling and as a result has not been able to empower their teams and organizations. And you get to see who's unable to learn and be adaptive. So crises are the ultimate test of leadership. And I also feel that they're the ultimate test of building leadership capability. And so paradoxically, I always say to young people, pray that you get a series of crises early in your career. Because like the blacksmith's forge, they will actually help you understand your shortcomings and they'll actually help you to see your strengths. But you'll learn kind of how important leadership is in navigating. And the word leadership itself comes from a Latin word which meant pathway. And the assumption was that all pathways at some point end in junctions and you have to make a choice. And the leader with the team collectively would make the right choice on that pathway. And of course, what a, what a crisis does is it offers you up dead ends, it offers you up many junctures, some of which actually will lead to worse conditions and some will lead you to solutions. But in the notion of a crisis, you can't go back on the path you've come on, which will become an important issue as we talk. So, why are ultimately these difficult times so, so both punishingly tough on leadership? I'll begin with the first point, which is that you're now under a microscope. Anyone in a leadership role is in a natural spotlight. And this is why we talk about the importance of role modeling and the uh, consistency between what you say and what you actually do in your actions. But in a crisis, that spotlight or microscope becomes far more intense. So one of the most important questions you can ask yourself right now as someone who is leading others is, how do I behave under stress? How do I behave under pressure? How do I show up in deeply challenging times with a lot of uncertainty surrounding me and my team? Are you calm or do you lose your temper? Do you stand up for what you believe in or do you tend to defer to what you think senior people wish for? Do you accept responsibility for mistakes and things that aren't going well? Or do you tend to blame others for that? And so this microscope is looking to test you on all these dimensions. And I have a very wonderful recent example. Uh, I live in the state of California. And we're in the midst of a voter recall of our governor, whose name is Gavin Newsom. And about a year or so ago, a Republican, uh, who's, who's quite an activist, decided he wanted to get Gavin, who's a Democrat, removed from office. And so he began a petition process. Now, in the state of California, this actually is kind of a, a, an unusual nuance, but we can recall governors and uh, there have been multiple attempts over the last 50 years to actually recall some, and some have been recalled. So uh, he was in the process of gathering these signatures. He, he, he hit 50,000, which is far short of what you need. And then Gavin Newsom helped him out. In the midst of the pandemic, uh, Gavin Newsom decided to attend a birthday party. But this wasn't an ordinary birthday party. This was this is quite a special one. And I should give you a little more background about Gavin because Gavin was one of the first governors in the United States to really marshal the public 
around safeguarding themselves. As a matter of fact, he had mandates that you had to stay at home, you had to work at home. Uh, you couldn't meet with more than a very small number of people. And he put these in place months before the birthday party. So the birthday party was held at a very, very extravagant restaurant called the French Laundry. As a matter of fact, they only offer reservations once a month for the next month. And within 10 minutes, all the reservations are gone. It's a very extravagant restaurant. You can spend several thousand dollars just on wine alone. And by the way, your meal by itself, if you decide to do the budget version, is probably five, six hundred dollars a person. So he decided to attend this birthday party in the midst of the pandemic. And of course, people recognized him. They pulled out their simple little phone, clicked a couple pictures. And what the pictures revealed when they were posted on social media is that Gavin Newsom wasn't even wearing a mask. And not only that, but he was with a large group of people. More than he had mandated was feasible or reasonable. One and a half months later, our Republican who was driving the recall had gathered 1.5 million signatures. So he went from 50,000 to 1.5 million, thanks to Gavin Newsom's birthday party. Now, Gavin probably hadn't thought that this microscope would ultimately potentially lead to his recall, but it highlights in crisis how we scrutinize our leaders to a far greater degree than they imagine. So let me go to the next dimension, emotional contagion. I had, uh, I had an opportunity to observe two managers over the last year uh, because of the work I was doing in, in organizations. And the first manager, they're both in pretty senior roles, was highly anxious and very pessimistic, um, but also quite cynical. And he would bring into meetings these emotions of cynicism and pessimism and kind of serious doubt about how, how are we going to get through this. Um, the other manager who I observed was much more tempered and she had a much more thoughtful and realistic optimism. While she appreciated the depth of the challenge in leading in a pandemic, she felt her team was clever enough across the board to help them navigate through the crisis. Our first manager, not so much so. As a matter of fact, he had the sense that potentially his team wasn't up to it. The first one turned to micromanaging, turned to managing details that he should not have been managing, turned to being a very controlling manager, took back some of the delegation he needed to actually push out the second one actually accelerated her delegation. She accelerated her empowerment. I placed my bets on the second one. And indeed, what I watched over the span of the year is that the first one is no longer in his organization. He was actually terminated. And the second one has very successfully led her team to adapt through the crisis. But what they both illustrated is this power of what we'll call emotional contagion. Um, there's a researcher at Wharton named Sigal Barsad, and she studies contagion. And she did a very interesting project in which she placed confederates in a large organization in what were project teams that were related to potentially reinventing the reward or performance systems in these organizations. The teams did not know that the quote leader who was put in charge of their initiative was actually a professional actor. A group of these actors were trained to be pessimistic, cynical, somewhat blaming of others, and the other group of actors were trained to be more optimistic, confidence building, but inspirational, and off the teams went. And they had a project horizon in which they had to deliver to a group of executives innovations in the performance and reward systems. So they actually had a tangible delivery. What uh, she discovered was that the teams led by the pessimist cynicists turned in on one another. Uh, they blamed one another. In other words, they replicated the behavior of their leader, quote, quote, leader. Uh, whereas the other teams actually proved to be far more innovative and came up with actual valid insights to revising the incentive system. 
What she showed in these studies was how quickly people were infected by the emotions of the person in the leadership role. As a matter of fact, if I were to ask you right now, how many of you have worked with someone who is basically quite negative and pessimistic? And then I ask you, how quickly were you infected by their negativity and pessimism? I'm going to guess you'd probably say in seconds, if not minutes. Uh, many of you have worked for the opposite, someone who's more thoughtful and energetic. And if I were to ask you how quickly you've been infected by their emotions, you'd probably tell me equally quickly. So emotions become very, very pronounced in a crisis, and they become an opportunity for you to learn how to manage them more powerfully. Many years ago in 2008, I was invited to work for one of the largest Swiss banks and they called me and they said, Jay, we need an inspirational leadership program. And I found that an odd request in 2008 with the world melting down. They were one of the largest money losing banks in the world. So I said, well, why is that? I said, well, we have two types of managers. We have a whole group who are hiding under their desks. They're so fearful, they think they're gonna lose their jobs. And by the way, they may, but it's really revealed their inability to lead. And then we have another group who are standing on their desks, pronouncing that everything's gonna be okay by tomorrow. But no one believes them because every day that arrives, things are getting worse. And we need somebody to help them understand that you have to be somewhere between these two extremes. And so one of the most important things that you and I have to do with leadership roles in crisis is this ability to walk a fine line between realism and what I'd call thoughtful or measured optimism. And by the way, this is very difficult. It's not as easy as it sounds. Each of us has a default mode, either towards more pessimism or towards more optimism. We tend not to have this balance. Jennifer George, a researcher at Rice University, showed that what positive optimistic emotions do is they encourage innovation and they build confidence and they empower. Negative emotions, when done constructively, create a sense of urgency. They also create a greater sense of realism. And so the leader has to figure out how to do this very wonderful balancing act between measured optimism, but also a sense of deep reality. The key point here is that no behavior that you and I demonstrate is neutral. In many ways, you and I are like musicians. And as we come into a meeting, we play a certain type of music that is quickly picked up by our audience, the team we're leading. And so you have to be deeply aware of the types of music you're playing throughout a day. And remember that as a leader, the primary arenas in which you're seen is in meetings. And so how each of us show up in those meetings throughout a day, we're literally broadcasting our emotions. Now, the other thing which we know from research is that when you're in a bad mood, you tend to be far more distracted. You tend to have less of an ability to concentrate. As well, you are less innovative. And so leaders who are consistently in a bad mood or a blaming mood actually undermine their own attempts at being effective and undermine their team. As a matter of fact, I would actually say they're probably not leading. So given your emotions being so contagious in a crisis, you have to learn to manage them very carefully. Uh, two leaders who I've always admired because they faced extremes that you and I hopefully will never face. One was an explorer in the Antarctic. He was a bit of a crazy explorer. He was British and he decided he would cross from one side of the Antarctic to the other using dog sleds. Uh, which he only came to that idea because he was beaten the year before by a Norwegian who actually got to the South Pole. And so we had to do something a little different. Uh, his name was Ernest Shackleton. Uh, he's not famous for crossing because he actually didn't cross. What he's famous for is that as he came to the coast to park his ship and begin the journey, his ship got trapped in the flows of ice and it sat there for an entire winter. 
And at a certain point, the ship begins literally falling apart because the ice flows are moving in and out under the surface of the ice. And at one point he realizes that his ship will most likely be destroyed. He gets all the men off and they sit in tents for about two weeks. And then all of a sudden there's this enormous explosion and the group of men watch the entire ship disappear under the ice. They're as far away from home as you could be. They only have a few small rowboats, but Shackleton doesn't panic. He says, men, the ship is gone. And so now we have a new plan. We're going back to England. That's where we're headed. So he abandons the original vision and miraculously, he brings everybody back alive to England. One of the reasons he succeeded was because he kept this incredibly calm nature. And while he had a confidant to whom he expressed his fears and anxieties and concerns, he didn't share that with his own team. Abraham Lincoln in my own country uh, was somebody who carefully guarded his negative emotions. He had a group of people with whom he shared it, but he was sickened by the bloodshed, his own countrymen killing one another, and he was worried about the capabilities of his generals, some of whom were incompetent. But he always spoke to the Union public with a sense of positivity and confidence, and he reminded them of the mission, of the purpose. And I was just hosting a panel with uh, people who lead large pension funds. And uh, the one who's done the most effective job during this crisis I attribute it to her reminding the team of their sense of purpose, of their mission, which is to help people in retirement navigate successfully the financial needs they face. So the final dimension is the wisdom of, of the collective, the wisdom of the team, the wisdom of the organization. In a crisis, no one actually can hold the answer. It's very similar to an entrepreneurial environment of which I've studied quite a lot of entrepreneurs. You have to be remarkably adaptive, but in an organization, you have to be able to create this term, courageous conversations, where people are willing to challenge the status quo, throw out ideas that potentially you could build upon. And it has to be supported by a culture of safety, that what I say, I will not be mocked for, I will not be you know, made fun of, people won't criticize, we're here to explore. In a crisis, there are actually two phases. The first is the actual crisis, um, where you and a leader not only have to manage your emotions, but you have to express your confidence in the team to navigate through the crisis. You have to build a sense of urgency to, to be certain that people do respond. And you have to ruthlessly prioritize. You don't often have the time and sometimes not the resources to do everything. So you have to have a great sense of clarity. What are our absolutes to do? But in the second phase, this is called the adaptive phase, the one we are now entering, things fundamentally have changed. The world will not be the same because of this pandemic. <clears throat> and as Churchill said, never, ever, ever waste a good crisis. And uh, leaders actually have to become exceptional learners and exceptionally adaptive in the midst of a crisis. Um, and that's true for all of us. I, as a professor, uh, often check in with my students and I say, how many of your professors are, have changed their style now that they're on a Zoom screen? And a bit to my dismay, uh, I pretty much heard maybe five to 10% of the professors change their style. Most of them continued on with the traditional lecture mode, uh, which having two teenage kids, I know is not effective, <laughs> as many of you also know. Uh, the attention span is pretty limited, and they tend to come to these screens to play video games or do social media, and, and listening to some professor droning on for an hour is somewhat painful for most of them. Uh, they failed to adapt. They failed to see this as a great learning opportunity. So you can't go backwards coming out of a pandemic. You have to under address the underlying causes and concerns and byproducts of the crisis and adapt you, yourself, and the organization. This requires an enormous reliance on your team. And it, it really requires you to call out the individuals who are extremely thoughtful and innovative 
and, and help them get support for their ideas. And again, it's this really this entrepreneurial phase that is demanded of organizational leaders, many of whom don't have much experience being entrepreneurial leaders. Let me also then close with some thought about resilience, because I think this is what this period in our lives really demands. And there's a researcher named Diane Kutu who has looked at people who have naturally or cultivated a deep ability to be resilient across multiple kind of domains. The first is they tend to have a down-to-earth acceptance of reality. So they're not dreamers, they're not overly optimistic, but at the same time, they believe that life is meaningful. And more importantly, that you and I can shape that meaningness, that meaningfulness. The third, which is that entrepreneurial ability, is they have this uncanny ability to improvise as they face setbacks. They have what you and I might call a growth mindset. As a matter of fact, they see setbacks and challenges in a very positive light. And they ask themselves, well, what can I learn from this challenge? Uh, is there any possible scenario by which this crisis could turn out to be a good thing one day? And how can I help my team and myself realize that positive scenario? So let me conclude by saying that you will really learn and test the depths of your leadership ability only through deep challenges and setbacks. There's a study at the Center for Creative Leadership some 40 years ago. A friend of mine, Morgan McCall, was involved. And one of the most important insights from that study was the power of negative experiences. And whether that was bad bosses, surprising setbacks, that they, with the right individual, built the resilience and intensity and learning that was needed to go to the next stage. Remember also that in a crisis, you're under far more intense spotlight, that microscope that means you can't go to that birthday party at the French Laundry. No behavior is seen as neutral. Your emotions are more contagious than they would ever be in any other situation. And it's critical to draw upon the collective wisdom of your team, but that happens only because of investments you have made prior to the crisis in building a culture of psychological safety. The other thing I would close with is I've never thought of leadership as a place in the hierarchy. How many of you have known senior executives who are not leaders? Just a quick show of hands. Feel free to put up both hands. <laughs> uh, lead leadership is a relationship, and it's a relationship you build with others. And I'll never forget when I worked at the London Business School, the, the single most effective leader was the lady in charge of housekeeping. She had lower turnover on her team than we had on our own faculty. Uh, they all came from Eastern Europe. They lived in London, which is an extravagant place to live. They would do anything for her. So just remember, it's the relationships you build and the kind of music you play in your interactions with everyone that determines your impact. And as the tool said, it's cool to be humane because we actually love to be led by more humane leaders. So thank you. A tool's got some questions for me. And uh, then I think we open it up. Well, thanks very much, Jay. What a, uh, what a powerful way to establish the basics of leadership. And um, I can tell you, I have so many things going on in, in my head. I made a lot of notes as you were talking. And I'm sure uh, my other colleagues who are on the call have a ton of questions for you. So I, let me change the gears a little bit. I, I have a natural tendency to jump onto the questions and build on the dialogue, but I'm taking a step back, Jay. And I would like to uh, talk a bit about influences which shaped your uh, hypothesis, your understanding of leadership early on in your childhood. So who you are today, what are those influences which shaped that when you were growing up? So um, there were several that are very important and probably, and it's a little bit of a paradox, in some ways, one of the most important ways at age four, I fractured my skull. Uh, I was jumping on a bed and I landed back on the headboard instead of landing on the bed and, and I literally cracked my skull. 
And I was informed by the physician at the time, who was quite a somber man. I'm not sure I would have told a four-year-old this, but he said, Jay, if you do that again, you're going to, to die. And at a very early age, I began to grapple with this idea of mortality, which of course at four, you have no idea what that means other than the fact you're gonna disappear and you won't be with your family. So early on, I had to ask myself, well, what is, what is, what is a good life? Uh, what is my potential? How do I, how do I realize a life that's really well lived? So, and again, by the way, I'm, I'm not sure I'd advise <laughs> anyone at four to grapple with that issue, but I've always grappled with it. So I'm deeply interested in our potential. I'm deeply interested in how we cultivate that. And uh, my father had a very, he had two very unusual jobs, which crystallized for me the importance of potential and leadership. He was the deputy chief of protocol of the United States State Department. So when a foreign dignitary came to America, he was usually the third or fourth person to greet them, and then he would host them during their visit in America. So he, he was the host for Nehru, for um, Queen Elizabeth, Khrushchev, <laughs> go down the long list, Charles de Gaulle, he, he met them all, he'd come home and tell us about them. So one, I learned that many of them were not leaders. <laughs> they just had a, a very impressive title. They were actually very challenging, difficult people. But a couple of them were exceptional, and he would share with us why they were exceptional. He then went on, um, because he was very entrepreneurial, and he became the curator of the White House. And he curated the White House for four presidents. And I used to joke that I got into the White House more often than Monica Lewinsky. Uh, but I would get in, you know, and, I, and so I was surrounded by, by leadership. I, at age 12, decided I needed to be a leader, so I ran for school office, and much to my surprise, I won. <laughs> and it's a little bit like we say, you know, uh, dogs like to chase uh, speeding cars, but when they get it, they're not sure what to do with the car. So I had this quote title, but I wasn't sure how to make it meaningful. And I had a very good teacher who helped me understand, all right, you, you, you got this leadership role, but now here's some things you can start doing. So I've always been engaged in leadership and I really in my teens decided that the way almost all of us will harness our potential and gifts to humanity is through leading. And that's because we are all, this is poet who I love, who's an Italian poet, said, we're all angels, but with only one wing. And it's only when we embrace one another that we're able to fly. And that's the story of leadership, that your potential, you're a one-winged angel, it's only when you literally harness the collective that you actually are able to realize your potential and the potential of others. So th those were the early influences. Very, 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 very impressive, Jay. And I can, by the way, see a lot of that coming through in how you shape your own thinking and express your own narrative on leadership. My next question is, um, it's probably more simple. What do you do other than um, your passion of building leaders for tomorrow? Uh, well, I, I have a wonderful family, so <laughs> I, I try to demonstrate leadership skills. I think I'm often being led by them more often than I'm able to lead them. Uh, all, all of you who are parents know that, that that's the ultimate test of leadership. <laughs> and, and you really start to realize that, oh my gosh, I needed some training here. I don't know why, but they don't have leadership training for parents. Um, so I, I love my family and we have a beautiful little golden doodle that we took on uh, during the pandemic. So I'm, I'm uh, learning what a lousy dog trainer I am. Um, I love adventure travel and I originally thought my career would be as an archaeologist. So I'm on the board of the American Institute of Archaeologists. Um, I'm very active in my children's high school. And I'm I'm the board chair there, so I have a lot of community involvement. And then I'm a, I'm a, I, unfortunately having a curator as a father, I'm an art collector. So I collect, as you can see behind me, contemporary photography and contemporary Japanese ceramics. So that, that satisfies my uh, needs for aesthetics in life. Fabulous. And, and a lot to keep you busy, I, I'm sure, Jay's. <laughs> Lots going on beyond, beyond the leadership. So I have a couple of other questions, and I see already um, you know, some questions are coming up in the dialogue box. 
And some of my friends who are on the call reached out to me yesterday with their questions. So we have a full kind of agenda for the next, uh, whatever, 17, 18 minutes or so. So my next question, actually, you covered it when you were talking, but I, I want to reinforce and bring it out, is about trust. So you talked about leadership emotions being contagious, especially during tough times. So those kind of spill over to people around you. So uh, people trust, people basically follow those leaders they can trust during difficult times. And I can share with you, there is a deficit of trust today. Uh, how do you see that and what leaders need to do to get back that trust of people to inspire them? So I think as all of us uh, know, um, trust is earned over time very slowly, but trust is lost very quickly. In other words, you can have one incident where the trust, your trustworthiness collapses. And one of the most interesting things I heard the other day, I was talking to a client and she said to me, she said, you know, we've been doing some training programs to help people be more empathetic during this pandemic. And so we've been training them to go out and ask people, how, how are you doing? <laughs> and we've gotten a lot of negative feedback because people say, well, Joe's never asked me about my family. And why is he now asking me about this? He, has he been to a training program? <laughs> so instead of resolving the problem, it's generated more cynicism. Yes. And I, I think trust is earned in everyday interactions. And I think people in leadership roles have to be very clear about what they are doing and saying. And it's that old thing, word and deeds, word and deeds have to really match up. I think in large part because many of us, particularly in, in demanding jobs, are racing from one activity to the next. We bring very limited self-awareness of how we're showing up. And because we don't have enough self-awareness, we're not able to monitor ourselves and catch ourselves and begin each day with an intention of building trust. I, I really think trust is something that's built around this idea of leadership as a relationship. Yes. And so you have to think about each relationship as uh, you're either building it or, or you're harming it. And I think very well said, uh, Jay. And I, by the way, talk about character of leadership. And you, you, you said, you know, trust is built over time. So is how you show up every day. I mean, your default behaviors, if those develop in a way that you don't have to act, you don't have to go ask people how they are feeling on a particular day. That's more natural. That's part of who you are. The impact is much more sustained and that trust or confidence in the leadership is much deeper, much stronger, no matter how strong the adversity they are facing together. So I think you captured this really well. Uh, I have a long list of my questions, but I'm going to shift to the questions which I received from the audience. I'm sure they are keen to listen to you and uh, get your responses. So the first one is, uh, and I consolidated, by the way, these questions. I got many of those into a few themes. In the world of power dynamics, humility in leaders may be seen as a sign of weakness. How can we change that? So that's, that is one of the most challenging questions I've heard, um, because I'm a big advocate of humility. And uh, crises really expose leaders who don't have humility. They really bring to the fore arrogance. Uh, um, there are as many of you can appreciate, because we represent 20 some countries in this room. Um, there are countries which and cultures which value more traditional forms of leadership, more of kind of a, a authority figures, dominant figures. And then there has been some really interesting research which shows that individuals who have been raised in families where there is an authoritative model of leadership demonstrated by one parent or both, or a complete absence of any kind of guidance and authority. So there are these two extremes. 
these individuals tend to gravitate, at least in their political choices, to authoritarian leaders. So you have a cultural dimension, which in some societies prefers the dominant authoritarian, non-humble leader. And you have family dynamics that set individuals up to want these kind of strong figures. Um, and, and of course, both, both, you know, anybody who's an authoritarian leader is going to stumble at some point. I, and I don't have an easy answer. And I was just reflecting on the fact we were going to have this call today. The other thing which is very unfortunate for us as human beings is we are drawn to great communicators. We are drawn to great rhetoricians. And if you look at some of the tyrants and um, just awful individuals who have led nations in the 20th and 21st century, it's because they had the gift of communications. They were remarkable rhetoricians. I had a young student yesterday, she was talking to me about her home country, and we were talking about the fact that her president right now is undergoing many, many setbacks. And what's being revealed is how incompetent his cabinet is because they're not able to deal with fires and uh, kind of local terrorism. And she said, well, you know, he's so gifted at communications. He's able to kind of seduce the nation into followership. So Atul, I wish I had a simple answer for that, but unfortunately human beings tend to be prone, particularly in the political arena, to potentially authoritarian figures who are charismatic and great and powerful communicators. We don't take enough of a critical eye and look at their record and kind of look at what their actions are doing until often quite late. Um, I do think it's something that we need to revisit in schools because I think that most schools are cultivating this cult of the individual heroic leader, uh, whereas in many, you know, 99% of leaders are people like ourselves. Literally, we are the leaders. Yeah, yeah. Those people running large organizations uh, are really a tiny, tiny part of the leadership pool. And so I think schools need to start recognizing that individual teachers, principals, the person running the sanitation department in your town <laughs> actually have leadership talent and, uh, and many of them are grounded, humble people. Perfect. I, I think that's a great response. And I know it's, there's no straightforward answer to that, but I think just being aware of your uh, humility as a strength, I saw, by the way, in the dialogue box that coming up, I think humility can be seen or should be seen as a strength of the leaders because that's what is gonna build that trust or confidence or generate and reinforce that inspiration in people to really follow on that track. So a lot of questions Jay came up on personal core or human core. So what defines you, your larger purpose, your personal values, which you will never compromise. So in the difficult times, uh, your core comes out, your default position comes up, and then you show up like that. You gave a great example of Gavin Newsom, you know, uh, who you are will show up in, in the face of adversity or challenges. The questions are around your personal core, is it static or is it dynamic and evolving and growing as you face new experiences, new challenges, grow, you know, more knowledgeable about things around you? Two, can you be deliberate about building awareness of who you are and then nurturing and, and reinforcing your personal core? So <clears throat> number one, it has to be dynamic. It cannot be static. Um, I think you know, the only certainty in life is change. Yeah. That's the only thing you can be certain of, that things will not be the same tomorrow. <laughs> That's, and so you have to be dynamic in order to be adaptive. I mean, I think it's one of the great things of human beings, despite our setbacks, we are very adaptive when we kind of pull ourselves together collectively. When I look across this workshop and I look at all of you, uh, I will see that there have been tipping points in your life where you've made important shifts in what you value because you, you have started to gain enough experience to realize, oh my gosh, you know, what I was after when I was 30 
gosh, that actually is a bit of an illusory goal. I, I, this is something I want now that I'm 50. And uh, I know it's that old saying, the first half of life is chasing success. And the second half is looking for significance. And so there's this wisdom that I think we all acquire over time that causes our core to shift and, and, and move. And then I'm sure many of you are like myself. Uh, when I was in, tw in my 20s, I had such different aspirations of who I would become. And a little bit like a snake, I've shedded those kind of dreams and aspirations as different opportunities came to me, as different challenges came to me. Um, so who I am today uh, is very different. Paradoxically, to your point of humility, <clears throat> I was raised in a family, my dad had a lot of ego, and I decided that I would be far more humble. <laughs> so I'm, I feel like I'm bragging about my humility, which is pretty egotistical, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> and I said that humility is a really important attribute, because as much as I love my father, he had a really strong inability to listen to his kids because of his ego. And I said, oh, that's a bad thing. You know, you, you need to be able to hear people. And uh, so, but that's a trait that stayed with me. And I hope it stayed with me throughout my life. So I do think there are certain core beliefs and values you hold on to. But I believe there's this other core that has to be dynamic. And uh, look at yourself during the pandemic and look at the ways in which you've changed. Now, do, do you need to be deliberate? Oh my gosh, yes. You have to be deliberate. You cannot be waiting for some uh, asteroid or alien spaceship to arrive and magically transform you. Um, I am, I am, believe in meditation. I, I think meditation is a really wonderful vehicle, both to self-awareness, but also to being able to monitor your emotions and reactions. And if any of you meditate, you know that you have to be so deliberate. It's painful. Because when you first start that journey, you say, my God, I could be doing 20 other things rather than sitting here following my breath. This is ridiculous. Let me, let me get out of this and get those things done. Um, and it's only by being deliberate that you cultivate most of these practices that will make you a truly, truly talented leader. Now, the dilemma is you have to know what to be deliberate about. And this goes back to my belief that <clears throat> we become exceptional leaders building upon strengths and talents. Uh, we don't become exceptional leaders addressing our gaps and weaknesses. We do need to tackle those, but those are more likely to get us in trouble rather than make us exceptional. And so you have to have some clarity around what are your core talents and gifts and how do you take them to the next level? And I've always felt because of that early childhood brush with death. What, what a shame if you were to journey through life without pushing your talents as far as you could push them. Perfect, that's great, great response. I think we have time for one more question and I'm gonna request actually someone of lots of great questions in the dialogue box. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. follow up with you uh, and make sure Jay, we respond to these questions so I can go back because people have great, great um, insights and questions here. Frank Harkin, if you are on the call, can you unmute and actually bring up your, it's a great question, but will you bring it up, Frank? Sure, hi Atul. Hey Frank. Hi Frank. Um, thank, thank you for picking my question. My question Jay is, um, We've all worked in, in huge and professional organizations, and these organizations have spent millions and millions of dollars in training, uh, in selecting the right people, and so on. But still, the situation is you find quite a large number of, let's say, at least mediocre leaders in the organizations. And the question is, why is this so? What's the basic flaw in, in, in the whole process? What do we need to do to get to a better number if we look at, uh, at this in 10 or 15 years from now? Great question. So Frank, a couple couple points come to mind. Uh, number one, I think um, while I'm an advocate of training, training by itself is insufficient. Uh, it's a little bit like you want to be a world-class athlete and so you focus just on diet. You eat better. You eat more protein, for example. 
Well, that's great, but both, but basically you've got to do a lot more conditioning. You have to have a deliberate practice every day to push your athletic talent. You need a coach. So as I describe this as an analogy, imagine the coach. So who's the boss? The boss is potentially the single greatest influence on your ability to demonstrate leadership. And they're also the one who will reward you for demonstrating leadership. So if you have a boss who is not supportive of leading, uh, you're in trouble to begin with. Uh, secondly, the boss is a model. And if many of the bosses, as you've described, lack leadership ability, <laughs> where do you go? Well, you, you, maybe you read about Mother Teresa or Abraham Lincoln. Well, those are the wrong models. <laughs> you can read about Elon Musk, but that's the wrong model too. So our models then are not very sufficient to help us navigate. Um, the second thing is many people don't understand that leadership is extremely difficult work. Leadership is not for everybody. Uh, I always like to begin my seminars by saying, why would you not want to be a leader? There are so many aspects of leadership. You have to deal with difficult people. You have to address conflict. You have to give candid and sometimes very difficult feedback to people. You have to be a model. <laughs> you have to kind of operate 24 seven. There are a lot of people, Frank, who do not want those headaches. They want to be free of all of that. So you have to understand that these are part of the ticket to the park of leadership. And then more importantly, you have to ask yourself, well, why might it be worth going through these demands. What's the reward by being a leader? And I've always said when you ask people, and, and you, uh, particularly great leaders, you know, why, why do you do this? They say, well, I'd rather shape the world than be shaped by the world. I love working with talented, bright people to make things happen. And I love developing people. And I know that if I do those three things well, I can create a multiplier effect in impact that I could not do by myself. And so uh, to your point, I think it's really poor role models, bosses who don't reward, the inadequacy of a single intervention like training, which needs multiple supports. And then the fact that a lot of us don't like the hard work of leadership. And so we avoid it. And by the way, think what it does to your credibility if you have a favorite person on your team, and everybody knows that, and you just love them. Well, you've already undermined your credibility as leader. Imagine if you don't tackle the low performing person because you don't like conflict. Well, you've just undermined your credibility as a leader. And so it's these, again, issues which all kind of tie back to trustworthiness, but also modeling that really make leadership, while it's very, very critical, a really tight wire activity. And I don't think we teach people enough of those high wire walking skills. Awesome. Jay, thanks very much. It was a great question and very insightful answer. I, I um, fear we are on the time. Um, I just want to take this opportunity, Jay, to thank you. I thought it was a wonderful conversation. Uh, I'm walking away wiser from this discussion. I'm sure a lot of us who were there in this dialogue took away some very, very relevant, easy to implement ideas and insights from you. I'll follow up, Jay, with some of the questions we could not address so that we can go back to our audience with the questions which they wanted to know more about you, uh, more about from you. And I can't thank you enough for sparing your time and making yourself available for this conversation. Atul, thank you. And thank you for allowing me to share my passion with all of you. Uh, lead well. The world needs you. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank and you. big thanks to Bhavna uh, for helping me and everyone who joined this conversation today. Our next dialogue will be on October the 19th with uh, Dr. Sven Hansen who is the founder of Resilience Institute in New Zealand. And that will be led by Rubina Verma from our Leadership at Humanity community. So thanks a lot and have a nice rest of the day. I will be sending the recording to all of you. Thanks again, Jay, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. All the best.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Atul. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Atul. Thank you very much.